Welcome everyone. My name is Tejasvi. I'm a student at Laksha TLP batch of 23. Today we have a special guest with us, Alex. Alex has done his bachelor's degree in physics, finance and economics. And after that he has done his masters in mathematics from Lund University and University of Berkeley, California. Alex is a serial entrepreneur and he has many successful startups under his belt. Currently he is a CEO in Master Exchange, a trading platform for music rights. He is also a venture par uh, venture partner in Nine Yard Equity, and so Alex, well, thank you for joining us. It's a great pleasure. So Alex is also taking a course in application of data sciences. So Alex, uh, the first question I want to ask you is, um, what's your philosophy on machine learning and AI? Right? How do you think this field fits in the advancement of a human civilization? So I think that this is one of the most important technologies that we as a humankind are working on right now. It's pretty evident that if we humans don't have to rely on our own cognition or our brain power anymore in order to make decisions, and if we can make decisions either with the help of models and algorithms and uh, any type of machine learning or even deep learning application, if they can help guide us in the way that we parse information, that we process it, and then that we make decisions or even make predictions in order to become smarter, that's going to help us quite significantly. And we can already see the impact of that today. So in the past few years, we have seen a Cambrian explosion of models coming out. Right? We have right now GPT-3, before that it was DALI and DALI-2. So how do you think all these, uh, this field of AI and ML is going to impact the global economy and the economy of India five to ten years down the line? But so again, since this is one of the most important technologies that we are working on, and the way that I like to frame artificial intelligence or machine learning, it is that it's the toolbox with tools that can be used basically in any industry and to solve any type of problem as long as it has to do with data and information. So now if we take the Cambrian explosion sort of, of applications and use cases of artificial intelligence like DALI and generation of images like you talked about or if we take GPT-3 or ChatGPT in order to generate human language or even answer questions and to summarize text etc. Those are only specific domains, but AI is relevant anywhere where we can collect data and where we can analyze data. And right now we are seeing a lot of breakthroughs because we have started designing models that almost has the same number of connections and parameters in these models as we have connections and parameters in our human brain. The biological collections, connections in our brain, of course, they are more sophisticated than maybe the parameters we have in a deep learning model. However, we have an exponential trend now of both progress and development, and I don't think that's going to stop anytime soon. The major bottleneck we have for language models, for example, is that we don't have enough data on the internet, not enough text on the internet, in order to make them even more capable. But this is something that I think we're going to solve, and we will be able to produce even more information mm -hmm. as we head into the future. And so I think slowly and slowly we are move, moving towards an AGI. And how do you think, uh, once the AGI is out there in the market, the normal behavior of the workforce or the way the economy works will change down the line, right? And uh, people who are planning to enter the workforce, what kind of changes do, do they have to prepare on their side to be better adaptive for this work environment? I have a daughter and she is two years and nine months. And if I today was going to prepare her for the workforce of the future and how she can mm -hmm. be like valuable in the way that she conducts work and what she contributes with to society or the world overall, I would actually teach her how to ask really good questions mm -hmm. and how to narrate things, how to come up with visions or with stories. For a long time now in human existence, we have been creators of tools, of systems. This might go back since we started with agriculture uh, tens or thousands of years ago or even with the Industrial Revolution when we started using technology at scale in order to be able to carry out work where we haven't, didn't have to rely on our own muscle power or on animals' muscle power, but we could do work with machines 
the era that we're entering today is that we can rely on machines again to process information, make decisions and create things for us. So then it's about us humans being really good sort of like directors for what the computer should do. Or we need to tell them and ask them questions that are framed in the right way so that we will get solutions. We don't have to come up with the answers anymore, but we ask the questions. And I think that's going to be a major change that we will see in the upcoming 10, 20 years. Humans will go from creators to narrators. And if you really want to prepare for that future, you should start exploring these tools that we have today where we ask the tools questions in order to solve problems for us. I think this ethos of yours is very relevant in the course that you teach, where us as students are allowed to collaborate, use any technical tools out there like GPT-3, you know, that will help us build a better, perform better in the, in the course. So is that, um, so when you designed the course, was that what you were thinking or what was the rationale behind keeping the course like this? It is very intentional because I see, I want the course on real world applications in data science, machine learning and deep learning that I teach here at Plaksha and in other places over the world to mimic the experience as much as possible of what it is mm -hmm. like to work in industry and in the real world. And in order to do that, I mean, if you're at a job in a startup or at a bigger company, then of course you will have access to the internet. Of course they are going to buy access to valuable tools like ChatGPT, if you could use them in order to become more productive and in order to better solve problems that the company has. So in academia, to actually limit people from having these tools and access to these powerful capabilities, even when they are writing finals and when you, or when you have an assignment or when you assess someone's skills, I think that can be a little bit disconnected from how it works in the real world. Sometimes it can be valuable actually to test if someone has read some material and doesn't only get the answer from the internet or from an AI model. But for most of the time, if you can design the evaluations so that the person who is evaluated can use the tool in combination with their skills in order to solve something that is basically impossible for the tool itself to solve or for it's also very hard for the human without the tool. I think that's the best type of assessment. So Alex, um, you're a CEO, CEO right now, and you have working in different firms as well, right? Despite that, you take, took out time from your busy schedule to be, and, to be in Plaksha and deliver this course in person, right? So what was the impetus behind that? So I really wanted to come here uh, to Plaksha and deliver the course in person. I was part of the first inaugural batch uh, mm -hmm. here at Plaksha, so back in 2019, when the university was just getting started. And this course is one of my favorite courses that I do deliver. So I've cut down on a lot of my academia and educational engagements now, but I really wanted to have the experience of teaching the projects and applications uh, in data science course here at Plaksha, because mm -hmm. it is truly a joy to meet all of you bright students in the TLP, and also to sort of like, it's a way for me to also stay current and I get inspired by interacting with all of you. And this is one of my favorite sort of like batches and programs in the world. Well, thank you, Alex, for that. And so um, you have been part of, Alex, you have been part of world-class university from Lund University to University of Berkeley at California, uh, University of California in Berkeley. Right. So how do you assess the overall community in Plaksha? I mean, you do have shared how your experience was. So where do you think um, our strengths are and what, what our weaknesses are and how the university will perform down the line? But so if we take universities like UC Berkeley or Lund University, these are universities that have been around for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And Plaksha is just getting started. But these universities, even the world-renowned ones, at one point they were also an idea that you had to execute on and you had to build like an academic institution, etc. Mm -hmm. I would say that the start of TLP and the start of Plaksha University overall has been very impressive according to me. And I think that Plaksha will have its footprint in history with the teaching approach. And you are very aware that the world around us is rapidly changing. 
And I think Plaksha is well positioned to see what the positive disruptions are for the education system and academia overall, and actually so that it can be beneficial for the students that are part of Plaksha University. I don't, I've visited many academic institutions, and I truly do believe that Plaksha is one of the more mindful ones when it comes to both being agile and also embracing disruption with technology in order to create a better experience that works well in the contemporary world. So our course over here is called Technical Leadership Program. As uh, it is technical and it also focuses on the leadership. You, Alex, as well, have worked on your master thesis that built the Berkeley Innovation Index, right? So how important do you think are the soft skill going forward in building the leaders, leaders and innovators of tomorrow? I'm a true believer in soft skills when it comes to leadership and that you should develop a sort of mindset and that you can have specific traits like characteristics in your personality that are important both to be a leader and to be an innovator and that these are things that everyone can practice if they are aware of what they can improve upon. If we take the Berkeley Innovation Index mm. as sort of a diagnostic tool in order to evaluate how innovative a person is, then this was research done by Iklak Siru and Ken Singer at UC Berkeley, mm. and I was fortunate to come in as sort of a data science person to implement these tools and create an algorithm for scoring uh, the innovation capabilities. But in this metric and in this measurement, you have traits like trust, you have traits like your comfort zone, how much you're willing to stretch that, your belief in yourself, uh, the resilience, like how much can you tolerate and handle failure and see that as a learning experience, diversity, can you collaborate with many different people from different backgrounds, and if you are just aware that these are valuable like skills and traits and characteristics to have and to develop, I think that you can improve on top of them, while at the same time also be able to be successful um, in the regards of both a leader and person who understands technology. But soft skills are truly important, not only hard skills. Mm. And so apart from having technical skills and soft skills, another important factor that goes on in building, building a good startup is the network of people you are in touch with. So how important do you think that the network of people plays a role in deciding whether a startup would be successful or unsuccessful? But your network and your <coughs> sort of degree of connections, it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. If you're going to start a research project, if you're going to start a startup, if you're going to enter into industry and get a specific job, etc. Because it's your network and the people that you have around you that you can reach out to, they will open up doors, they will give you recommendations, they will be the ones that can teach you things that you're not aware of without you having to look up the information yourself. So to have a network that you cherish, that you enjoy to be part of, and that also can help you to move forwards, I think that's extremely important and something that you should curate and cultivate over time and also be mindful about. Mm. So Alex, final question. Mm -hmm. um, as a student, when I attended your course, so we are halfway through the, your course and I really love all the information that I'm getting, right? in terms of application on where, how to use the model, how to train them, right? What, what are the real world application, how to deploy them? So when you take a course like this, what do you want the students to learn? Like, you get my question, right? Absolutely. So the final learning outcome or the ultimate mm -hmm. learning outcome that I see from the projects and applications in data science course here at Plaksha, and also that we had for the Data X course at UC Berkeley and that I have from in many executive education programs. It is to demystify the emerging and state-of-the-art technologies. So many people will hear concepts like artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, data science, and they won't really know what it is. Or if they are engineers, they might already be bored with the topics because they've only seen them from the theoretical side and they have not really seen where the frontier is and how you build systems and tools and solutions to problems that are some of the most complicated and difficult problems that we have in society today. But I would love to like have my course 
be a gateway into the universe over the frontier of where artificial intelligence is, or machine learning and deep learning, and give access to those tools. I mean, it's an introductory course. We cannot go through all of the nuances that relate to these topics, but it's sort of a wonderful introduction in order to be familiar with the ecosystem of possibilities and then to be able to venture down any path in order to solve a hard problem in the world today. So thank you, Alex, so much for taking, first of all, taking the time out and having this conf uh, conversation, sharing your insights on this. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure.